members in support of our teaching of A River Runs Through It. My name is Melissa Court. I'm a member of the English department here, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Rabbi George Gittleman. Um, I will admit up front, personal bias, Rabbi George is my own rabbi. He is the rabbi at Congregation Shomre Torah, which some of you may have passed. It's on Bennett Valley Road, across from the Waterfall Towers, if you know that area. Um, he's been there since 1996. He grew up, he's going to talk about this a little in his, in his talk. He grew up in Kentucky. He earned his BA in American history at the University of Vermont. And then he went on to Hebrew Union College, where he earned a master's of Hebrew letters and eventually studied until he became ordained as a rabbi. Um, as a rabbi, he's worked in various places before he came to Shomri Torah, um, including Alaska, which I'm sure he said yes to just because it gave him opportunities to fish. Um, <laughs> he has this wonderful combination of being a serious fly fisherman and a rabbi. Um, he teaches around this community. In fact, he just ran into somebody who had taken one of his classes at the Center for Spiritual Living. Um, so if you like him as a teacher, there's other opportunities to experience his teaching. Uh, he also is a senior rabbinic fellow at the um, well-known Shalom Hartman Institute in Israel, which is a rare institute in Israel because it advocates pluralism between the various uh, elements of Jewish life in Israel, uh, one of the many complications of life in Israel. Um, so he is a scholar, a religious leader, a teacher, and my rabbi, Rabbi George Gittleman. Thank you. I always think it's strange that we clap before we know what we're going to get. <laughs> Just a word about Melissa. Melissa has taught me more about writing than all of my teachers combined and has been a great partner in building synagogue life. And if this goes on too long and is boring, it's because I didn't listen to Melissa's advice this one time. So those are the opening, that's the opening line of A River Runs Through It. And I think it's quite startling. In our family, there was no clear line between religion and fly fishing. If you think about it, what does religion and fly fishing have in common? After all, the goal of fly fishing is to pierce the mouth of a fish by fooling it into thinking that the menacing thing in the water is actually something it likes to eat. Once this cruel charade is over and you have the fish on, you then proceed to haul it through the water the more it struggles, the better. We love a fish with fight. You then lift it in the air, look at it in various poses for the camera, while it gasps for a breath, and then you dispose of it in various cruel ways. Break its neck, put it in a cooler, maybe let it go, depending on your goal and its size. Now, unless you're contemplating the Inquisition, this does not seem like religion to me. And I will confess, as a religious person, I have at times struggled with this question. In fact, I have a colleague um, who declared that fish did not have souls, so she didn't have to worry about the fish she was catching and releasing. She has not caught a fish since. So how is religion and fly fishing connected? Well, according to Webster, if this is going to work, let's see, it works. The religion is the belief in a god or in a group of gods, an organized system of belief, ceremonies, and rules used to worship a god or group of gods. I have known more than one fly fisher person whose reverence for trout bordered on religious, and there are many ritual experiences in a day on the water, arranging flies, practicing your cast, approaching the water. Yet this definition still seems lacking, at least for our purposes. So I'd like to share a more personal perspective on the novella, which I believe is one of the greatest novellas written in American literature in the 20th century, a gem of a story. I've been drawn to it since I first read it some 30 years ago, I'm 52. It brings, so I bring to it my experience as a son, a father, a brother, a fly fisherman, a religious person, all roles I share with Norman MacLean, all themes found in the book, from the love of the river to the love of family, 
and the sense of great loss that permeates the whole. I first went fishing when I was around five. I grew up in Louisville, Kentucky, just a few minutes from the great Ohio River, no mecca of fly fishing, but a river all the same, where we would walk, me and my mom, who's sitting over there, down to the banks, actually I think it was a dock, and throw our baited hooks into the water, worms I think, and we would catch fish, bluegill. I actually have a picture of a bluegill for you. There's the Ohio River, not exactly where we went, huh mom? Nice though, and there's a bluegill. And if you notice, actually, let's see if this works. Um, how does this work? How do you make the light go? There you go. That is a fly, a fake fly. Those were the fish, the first fish I caught, but they were not the first fish that caught my attention. That happened a few years later in Miami Beach, Florida, where my grandma Ida lived. That's my grandma Ida. And that's me when I was, I don't know, pretty young. She lived at the top of the Doral Hotel, and Ida hated my hair. I had long hair. It doesn't look that long there. And she always wanted to cut it. But she loved me in spite of my hair, and she especially loved to take me down to the docks to fish. It was a very simple rig, a thick string wrapped around a plastic kind of holder, with a large barbed hook. She'd skewer a piece of frozen shrimp, kosher shrimp, <laughs> and I'd toss it over the edge into the murky salt water and wait. We caught fish little, mostly eight inch long, but one day we went through our usual ritual of walking down to the dock, finding our place, baiting the hook, me chucking it over, and then the wait when a fish, I mean a whale of a fish, a monster of a fish, took my bait. My string went taut and I held on tight. It pulled hard and lunged for open water. I desperately tightened my grip, struggling to keep a hold of my rod. Grandma Ida screamed as it looked like I was going in with the fish when the line snapped and I ended up on my tukus, as she said. That's Yiddish for tail, but ass looking incredulous and in awe and wonder at the broken string I held in my hand. Awe and wonder. The renowned early 20th century philosopher, William James, in his classic work, The Varieties of Religious Experience, writes that, quote, all religion begins with awe, awe and wonder. That's what I felt holding the frayed string in my hand. What was it, a shark? A sea monster, a dragon? What lurks below the surface of the deep? From that moment on, fishing for me became a mystery, a search, a longing for things I could not see but dreamed about. As I grew, I came to know the local lakes and ponds and especially the still waters on the golf course of the Standard Country Club. I can't believe that Melissa found this photo where my family were members. It was the Jewish club in town, which was necessary if you wanted to play golf or swim in a pool, since when I grew up, Jews could not belong to anywhere else. There were bass and bluegill on the lake. I fished that water with a fury and was so successful at catching fish that the older anglers complained I was ruining it for them. This is true. I had by then graduated from bait fishing to lures, but was still years away from fly fishing. It was my stepfather's dear friend, Jack Shapiro, who taught me how to fly fish. Hold on a second. I was a freshman at the University of Vermont, and he lived nearby on the shores of Lake Champlain. He knew I was mad about fishing, but primitive in my methods. So one day he invited me over saying, I have something I think you are going to like. I was intrigued and showed up a day later. It was a late October day and the fall foliage was a blaze of orange and red. We stood in his backyard, the lake shimmering before us as Jack taught me the four count rhythm of the fly cast that McLean describes as an art played out between 10 and two o'clock. Where are you? There we go. 
as we stood in his backyard, oh, let me find my place, it's harder than it looks. And as he writes, if you have never picked up a fly rod before, you will soon find it factually and theologically true that man by nature is a damn mess. I would like to say I was a natural, but that was not the case. In fact, I spent the first 10 years of fly fishing catching everything but fish, trees, bushes, people fishing with me, my dog a few times. What Abraham Joshua Heschel, one of the greatest Jewish thinkers of the 20th century called the awe of the ineffable, pervades the novella in my own experience, both as a fly fisherman and as a religious person. It's why I can have a great day on the river and not catch a fish. It is the ground for my understanding of religion and the first place that religion and fly fishing intersect. It's also one of the reasons I love to live in Sonoma County. Having a rough day, go to the beach. Like, go to Salmon Creek. Ever been there? Or go to Hood Mountain. Or go to Sonoma Regional Park. All these places can really bring to us a sense of awe. Surrounded in such beauty, it's hard to deny how lucky we are to be alive. McLean writes with eyes made for wonder, and in that sense, seeing Montana or even fly fishing through his eyes is a religious experience. Take, for example, this description of Paul casting along the Blackfoot River. It's found on page 29 if you're following in the book. Below, he writes, was the multitudinous river, and where the rock had parted around him, big grain vapor rose. The many molecules of water left in the wake of his line made momentary loops of gossamer, disappearing so rapidly in the rising big grain vapor that they had to be retained in memory to be visualized as loops. So he's throwing his line back and forth, back and forth. He's in this canyon, and it's Montana. The spray emanating from him was, was finer grained still and enclosed him in the halo of himself. The halo of himself was always there, always disappearing, as if he were candlelight flickering about three inches from himself. The images of himself and his line kept disappearing into the rising vapors of the river, which continually circled to the tops of the cliffs where, after becoming a wreath in the wind, they became rays of the sun. Or this less reverent but equally poignant description of the moment after the big fish gets away. Get you there. Poets talk about spots of time, but it's really fishermen who experience eternity and compressed into a moment. No one can tell what a spot of time is until suddenly the whole world is a fish and the fish is gone. I shall remember that son of a bitch. There's something about these epic fish that get away that sticks with you, burned into one's memory like a breathtaking sunset. I'm not sure I fully understand the experience, but at least part of the story is the mystery of it all, the fact that you never know what can happen on any given day, and you will never know what took your fly that day. You know, I actually rarely keep the fish I catch. They are too beautiful to kill and eat. It is a prayerful moment when you release a trout back into the stream, holding it gently against the current so that the water flows through its lungs, its gills, and it revives, feeling the sleek, muscular body come back to life, watching the rainbow of colors pulse and shimmer in the undulating current. One moment the trout is in your hands, a flash of movement, and it is gone merged back with the river. Along with awe and wonder, fly fishing offers the possibility for another religious experience described in the book and also attested to in many mystical accounts, and that is oneness. I sat, McLean writes, there in the hot afternoon, trying to forget the beaver and trying to think of the beer. So they'd been out on the river. There was a dead beaver there, which was pungent, but had attracted bugs and had attracted fish. And he had stashed beer along the river, but he didn't know this, but Neil, his brother-in-law, had already drank the beer. 
Maybe he actually knew it by then. That's why I was trying not to think about it. But OK, that's the scene. So he's trying to forget about the beaver. I will also try to forget my brother-in-law and old Rawhide, a prostitute whose brother-in-law had been hanging out with. I knew I was going to have a long time to sit here and forget because my brother would never quit with three or four fish as I had, and, he, and even he was going to have a hard time getting more. I sat there and forgot and forgot until what remained was the river that went by and I who watched. On the river, the heat mirages danced with each other and then they danced through each other and then they joined hands and danced around each other. Eventually, the watcher joined the river and there was only one of us. I believe it was the river. In this passage, our narrator almost falls into a sense of oneness with the river. But in my experience, fly fishing, unlike, say, bait fishing, where you simply chuck out into the water something the fish can't resist, requires an attunement with the environment that opens up the possibility for transcendence. This is because to successfully fly fish, you need to mimic the natural food supply of the trout. And to do that, you need to learn the ecosystem of the river, its flows and currents, its bug life, in all its stages, even the birds along the river give you invaluable information about when and how to fish. So for example, I fish the Yuba River a lot outside of Marysville, and there there are lots of swallows. Um, they're cliff swallows mostly, and also um, swallows that live in, bur in trees, tree swallows. And I don't know if you know these birds, but they're like little jet fi fighters. They zoom around, and they eat insects on the fly. So you'll be on the river, and you'll see no swallows, and um, you won't catch any fish. But as soon as you see the swallows start to move down towards the river, you know that the bugs are going to rise and the fish are going to start to bite. And so you can time your fishing by actually the swallows. But if you don't know the swallows, you don't know the river, and you're much less likely to catch fish. So we get a lovely glimpse of this on the brother's last outing. If you remember the story, at first the fishing is very slow, but then the narrator notices that a certain large bug called a stonefly is hatching. It's, it's like this long. It has wings almost as long as the body. It has a yellow, greenish body. This one, anyways. As it turns out, his brother Paul, the master fly fisherman of the family, does not have the fly. He doesn't have the bug that will mimic this stonefly in the water. And he refuses to borrow one. A few minutes pass, and now Paul is catching fish. His brother is not. What happened, Paul's brother asks. And this is different. If you watch the movie, actually, Paul comes and gets the fly. But read the book. The book is much better than the movie. By the way, don't think you can just watch the movie and know this book. That's a big mistake. OK. He writes, well, he says, this is his explanation for how come he was catching fish and his brother wasn't. And you'll see how he understood the ecosystem of the river. He was attuned to it. Well, he says, the first thing I noticed about this hole, and it's not literally a hole, it's a spot in the river where the fishing is good, was that my brother wasn't catching any. There's nothing more noticeable to a fisherman than that his partner isn't catching any. And nothing more noticeable when his partner is and you're not. This made me see that I hadn't seen any stoneflies flying around this hole. Then he asked me, what's more obvious on earth than sunshine and shadow? But until I really saw that there was no stoneflies hatching here, I didn't notice that the upper hole where they were hatching was mostly in sunshine, and this hole was in shadow. Then I knew, he said, if there were flies in this hole, they had to come from the hole above. That's in the sunlight, where there's enough heat to make them hatch. So the bugs need a certain temperature to actually morph and fly away. And the sunlight creates that temperature. Without the sunlight, it doesn't happen. He figures this out. After that, I should have seen them dead in the water because they were coming up above stream, so they should be floating downstream. Even though it's sh shadowy down here and cooler, they're dying up here, falling on the water. I should see them down here. But I didn't. Since I couldn't see them dead in the water, I knew they had to be at least six or seven inches under the water where I couldn't see them. So that's where I fished. Fly fishing, for me, is very much a mindfulness practice where I try and focus all my attention on the totality of my experience, 
from that place of focus also flows reverence, reverie, and sometimes a sense of oneness, the separate eye of the ego melting away into the totality of being. While fly fishing plays an important role in A River Runs Through It, at its essence, the novella is a story about family relationships, especially those between a brother and a father and his sons. Fly fishing is the medium like the river that carries the story along. Of course, McLean is not the first American writer to work the waters of fly fishing and family. It's a well-worn genre populated with folks like Ernest Hemingway. Where are we? Oh, you guys didn't have that on the screen? Sorry. This is a new medium for me. Richard Ford. So first guy is, uh, where are we? Ernest Hemingway, Richard Ford, and that's Raymond Carver. Not a great picture, but a great writer. Raymond Carver actually is my favorite, and I believe the greatest short story writer of contemporary American literature, some would argue. And I first read uh, Raymond Carver when I was, I want to say 16, and I still read Raymond Carver. Carver used fly fishing as a backdrop for his gritty, sparse tales of quiet desperation and longing. What's missing in Carver but present in McLean is love and a kind of optimism that even in heartbreak, there's the consolation of memory. It's one of the beautiful things about this novella is it is heartbreaking, but the love of the family endures and there's some optimism in that and in the redemption of memory. So this love is evident from the first page description of his father, who we are told was a Presbyterian minister and a fly fisherman. It is true, he writes, I don't know if this one's, I don't think this one's up. It is true, he writes, that one day a week was given over wholly to religion. And then the narrator lists all the religious activities he and his younger brother Paul had to participate in, Sunday school, morning services, the study of Presbyterian dogma, afternoon services, and evening services. As a rabbi with twins who are now freshmen in college and came to the JC when they were in high school and, and really enjoyed it, I'm really um, uh, concerned about the plight of PKs, pre preacher's kids, or uh, RKs, rabbi's kids. And there's no doubt in my mind that the narrator and his younger brother Paul would have found the religious rigor of Sunday oppressive and intolerable if it were not for their love for their father, who the narrator tells us would take a break between services and walk the hills with his sons to recharge. Ostensibly, this was the time he would test them on their catechisms, their, their Presbyterian dogma. But the narrator writes, he never asked us more than the first question, what is the chief end of man? And we answered together so one of us could carry on if the other forgot. Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. This always seemed to satisfy him, as indeed such a beautiful answer should have. Two boys of the rough and tumble type described in the book must have had a mighty strong love for their father to endure so much religion when they could have been fishing. McLean doesn't spell it out for us, but in between the lines we feel the love and it sustains us through the whole story. I was initiated into fly fishing by my mother and her mother, but it was my father who taught me how to fish. And my parents were divorced, and he would pick me up in the dark hours of the early morning, long before the sun was up, and we would drive to one of the number of lakes a few hours from Louisville, Kentucky. We'd arrive just before dawn. I always fell asleep in the car and never really woke up until the boat was briskly parting the calm early morning waters of the lake, the hum of the outboard echoing in the distance, the mist rising off the lake, cool and wet on my face. That's my dad holding his hat, and I'm not exactly a kid there. I don't know. And that's Chester. And he looks like a redneck, and he is a redneck, but he's also a nice guy. <laughs> this is Kentucky. We'd fish and talk the day away. We caught fish, me and my dad, but fishing was the pretext for what our trips were really about. The binding of a father to his son, 
and the transmission of knowledge. My dad just died a couple, like six weeks ago. Fishing lore for sure, but much more from one generation to the next. In truth, my father was not much of a fisherman. <laughs> Fishing for him was really an excuse to be on the water. He loved the water and to tinker with boats. That was his true love. But we made a good pair, a father obsessed with water and boats and a son crazy for catching fish. Even so, my dad taught me how to tie the hook to the line, where to look for fish, how to cast a spinning rod, and he set me on a path of learning the rest, which never ends. If the religious experience begins with awe, it is fructified, realized in relationships. I learned this first from the German Jewish philosopher Martin Buber, who's famous for a book he wrote called I and Thou. And the basics of I and Thou are that you find God in between people. When you treat another person as a thou, someone created in God's image like yourself, it's an I-it relationship if they're just a transaction, a means to an end. But if you see them as another human being animated with divinity like you, then God arises. And he describes the first time he realized this, and it actually wasn't limited just to human beings. His first realization came with his horse. He writes, when I was 11 years of age, spending the summer on my grandparents' estate, I used to steal into the stable and gently stroke the neck of my darling, a broad, dapple gray horse. When I stroked the mighty mane and felt the life beneath my hand, it was as though the element of vitality itself bordered on my skin. It let me approach, confided itself to me, placed itself elementally in the real relationship of thou and thou with me. The horse, even when I had not begun by pouring oats for him in the manger, very gently raised his massive head, ears flicking, then snorted quietly as a conspirator gives a signal to be recognizable only by his fellow conspirator, and I was approved. It's pretty, it's beautiful. I doubt McLean wrote River Runs Through It with Boober in mind. You never know, he was a quite literate man. Yet, the book is a soliloquy to the sacred, if you will, holy nature of relationships. We can see that in several scenes we will turn to now the first comes just after the narrator picks Paul and his girlfriend up from jail where they were sobering up from an unfortunate night out on the town. I don't know if you remember this in the book, but Paul gets in trouble regularly, but this time it's ominous. The trouble seems to be worse, and they are in no state when he gets them. He has to drag the girlfriend out, and Paul is able to walk. Our narrator de deposits Paul and his friend at Paul's apartment and then drives to the small town of Wolf Creek, this is a short passage describing what he was thinking about as he drives. And remember, our theme here is relationships. There we go. Then about 12 miles before Wolf Creek, the road drops into the little prickly pear canyon where dawn is long in coming. In the suddenly returning semi-darkness, I watched the road carefully, saying to myself, hell, my brother is not like anybody else. He is my brother and an artist, and when a four and a half ounce rod is in his hand, he is a major artist. He doesn't piddle around with a paintbrush or take lessons to improve his short game of golf, and he won't take money even when he most need it. And he won't run anywhere from anyone, least of all the Arctic Circle. It is a shame I do not understand him. Yet even in the loneliness of the canyon, I knew there were others like me who had brothers they did not understand but wanted to help. We were probably those referred to as our brother's keeper, possessed of one of the oldest and possibly one of the most futile and certainly one of the most haunting of instincts. It will not let us go. I think the key phrase is, it will not let us go. Sibling, parent, children, the bonds we have with family, for better 
and for worse, will not let go and define in some powerful ways who we are. This next passage occurs much later in the book after their ill-fated outing with Neil, that's his brother-in-law. Um, if you remember, Neil wants, Neil's got a bad hangover. He's with his uh, prostitute girlfriend, and um, he feigns fishing but ends up taking their clothes off, and I'm not sure what they do before, but they fall asleep, and they get severely sunburned all down his backside. So... Um, He's bringing his brother-in-law back now, severely burned, not really clothed because the clothes hurt too much. And we're going to pick up where he faces his, his spouse, Jesse. Jesse, I said, and this one isn't on, on there. Um, it's on page 76 and 77, though, if, you're, if you have a book. Jesse, I said, I don't like him. This is the brother-in-law I doesn't like. I never will, but I love you. Don't keep testing me. By giving me no choices. Jesse, don't let him. I stopped from getting on because I knew I should have found a shorter way to say what I had already said. Don't let him what, she asked. What were you going to say? I I can't remember what I was going to say, I replied. Except that I feel I have lost touch with you. I'm trying to help someone, she said. Someone in my family. Don't you understand? I said... I should understand. I'm not able to help him, she said. I should understand that, too. Tell me, she asked, if my brother comes back next summer, will you try to help me help him? It took a long time to try to say it, but I said it. I said, I will try. Then she said, he won't come back. Then she added, tell me. Why is it that the people who want help do better without it, at least no worse? Actually, that's what it is, no worse. They take all the help they can get and are just the same as they always have been. And then he says, except they are sunburned. That's no different, she says. Tell me, I ask, if your brother comes back next summer, will we both try to help him? If he comes back, she nodded. I thought I saw tears in her eyes, but I was mistaken. In all my life, I was never to see her cry, and also, he was never to come back. Without interrupting each other, we both said at the same time, let's never get out of touch with each other, and we never have, although her death has come between us. I brought this passage for a few reasons. I think it's beautiful, for one. And while the book is pretty manly and not all that female friendly, this passage is so tender and intimate and really shows you the versatility of the author. There's also here the recurring theme which runs through the whole story, the limits of our ability to know and help even the vows in our lives. This is how their father puts it, the minister, towards the end of the novella, He's talking about Paul's death, his murder. So it is, he said, and actually this one is here. There we go. So it is, he said, using an old homiletic transition, that we can seldom help anybody. Either we don't know what part to give, or maybe we don't like to give any part of ourselves. Then, more often than not, the part that is needed is not wanted. And even more often, we do not have the part that is needed. It is like the auto supply shop over town where they always say, sorry, we are just out of that part. I love this passage, but it's, it's heartbreaking. It's hard enough to lose a son, which he did, to feel that you just didn't give him what he really needed, never had the right part. Even more devastating for a retired pastor who committed his whole life to serving and helping others to admit that, quote, we can seldom help anybody. That love, knowledge, good intentions will not necessarily overcome the challenges, the mystery that confound relationships of all kinds. 
Paul's death, like most that occur outside the life cycle, you know, he died young as opposed to old, leaves his family with more questions than answers. They want to know why he had to die, and especially if they could have done anything, anything to help. They are sad and frustrated, yet even in their grief, the current of familial love flows strong and clear. In the final passage of the novella, the three of them, the brothers and their father, go fishing. And it is on the waters of the Blackfoot River where the true nature of relationship, the love they have for one another, is fully expressed. Not only was I the, on the wrong side of the river to fish, but Paul was a good enough roll caster to have already fished most of my side from his own. But I caught two more. After I caught these two, I quit. They made ten, and the last three were the finest fish I ever caught. They weren't the biggest or the most spectacular fish I ever caught, but they were three fish I caught because my brother waited across the river to give me the fly that would catch them, and because they were the last fish I ever caught fishing with him. So this passage brings me to the last subject I would like to explore with you all this afternoon, and that is death and memory. As a rabbi, being with people as they walk through the valley of the shadow of death is a regular part of my life. I have literally filled a section of a cemetery in the last 19 years of service here. In addition, keeping faith with those who sleep in the dust, remembering the dead, is a basic and important Jewish value. And I'm a rabbi, and I'm Jewish, and I'm here. So there you go. Over the years, this close-up view of death, loss, and memory has taught me a few things which are mirrored in A River Runs Through It. This includes the question that haunts Paul's family. Could I have done anything to help? No matter how much we do, how hard we try, when we lose a loved one, we rarely are freed from that question. This question is asked over and over again in the story and is the most raw and poignant at the end. My father came back with another question. Do you think I could have helped him? Even if I might have thought longer, I would have made the same answer. Do you think I could have helped him? We stood waiting in deference to each other. How can a question be answered that asks a lifetime of questions? Another truth also present here is how limited is our ability to truly know even the most beloved in our families. Paul was a mystery to his family. They knew him intimately, yet they felt as if they did not know him at all. For, as Paul's mother says near the very end, it is those we live with and love and should know who elude us. And then there's memory. On one level, the whole novella is about memory and the deep human desire to hold on to those we love and lose through memory. More than that, to redeem our dead, to go back again and again and try to make it okay, even especially when it isn't okay. And Paul's death wasn't okay. Yet ultimately, what do they remember about Paul? That he was beautiful. This to me is another one of those religious moments in the book. The idea that love can rob death of its ultimate sting. And that our loved ones live on in us. In as much as we can recall and embody the good they did and were when they were alive. I began at the very beginning. And would like to conclude with the last words of the story which read like scripture to me, poetic with a depth of feeling and a sense of unity, 
and the mystery of all being. Now, nearly all those I loved and did not understand when I was young are dead, but I still reach out to them. Of course, now I am too old to be much of a fisherman, and now, of course, I usually fish the big waters alone, although some friends think I shouldn't. I often do not start fishing until the cool of the evening, then the arctic half-light of the canyon, all existence fades to a being with my soul and memories and the sound of the Blackfoot River and a four-count rhythm and the hope that a fish will rise. Eventually, all things merge into one, and a river runs through it. The river was cut by the world's great flood and runs over rocks from the basement of time. On some of the rocks are timeless raindrops. Under the rocks are the words. And some of the words are theirs. I am haunted by water. Turn the lights on. Good question. Yeah, guys have to wake up first. <laughs> All right, great. Thank, Thank you. you. Very much. Thank you. Thanks for coming.